almost there. Hey guys, welcome to the Massive Iron Channel, Massive Iron Live. It is Friday, uh, August 19th, and I'm very depressed because it's getting cold again. I feel, I feel like we just had the longest win like here in Ohio, we just had the longest winter ever. And I feel mm -hmm. like in May it finally started to warm, or June it finally started to warm up. And like now, you know, the school buses are gone, it's freezing. Anyway, um, welcome <laughs> to the Massive Iron Channel, guys. I do Massive Iron Live every Friday at 11 Eastern, 11 Eastern. You don't want to work, so just tune in. No one wants to do anything on Friday. This is the best way to spend your Friday. At least my mom says so. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, guys, um, before we get into things, we got a topic we're gonna, gonna going to cover um, before I introduce my guest. Every week on live, I get uh, some some uh, fallout, some feedback, someone thinking I'm ignoring their comments, blocking their comments. Last week, I had it as well. Someone thought I was blocking their comments about vegan bodybuilding. It is not the case. Uh, if your comment doesn't show, I'm not blocking it. It is the YouTube system. I try to say this every week, guys. If your comment's not going through, shorten it, reword it, or head over to Instagram at Ben the Barman, at Ben the Barman, slide into my DM. Now, we're, we're going to cover a topic. I'm, I'm here with Stan Strength. And um, let me get this banner off here before we uh, go crazy. I'm here with Stan Strength. And we're, we're going to talk about uh, an, uh, an article from Nick Tuminello called Five Barbell Exercises You Shouldn't Do. Uh, but before I do so, uh, Stan Strength is joining me. You are not Faz Lifts. You don't look like Faz Lifts. You're not from the UK. Could you introduce yourself? Hey, my name is Carosta King, StanStrength.com. And you can follow me on Stan Strength on Instagram, Stan Strength on YouTube. Um, just a regular guy really interested in strength and size training primarily and i'm really honored to be here uh, talking with you guys and with uh steve so um this uh, gentleman stan strength has a youtube and instagram youtube channel please go over and check it out um pops out about a video once a week but they're doing pretty good you just had the bald omni man on correct and you did a video or a podcast with basement bodybuilding um, yes, I just had a uh, bald Omni man on the channel, had an hour long bro talk. And then, um, myself and Brandon, we, uh, do a couple other like, uh, videos together sometimes mainly podcasts though, talking about training and, um, like trying to get rid of like certain, like bad mindsets when it comes to building muscle. So we're going to hop into something here. I, I've been wanting to do a topic, um, to kick off and man, it took me to Yahoo of all things. I didn't even know. <laughs> Yeah, who still existed, right? Yeah. But um, ignore that. This was sent to me by a client, and it's from Men's Health, which obviously has some kind of a partnership with Yahoo. Uh, but I want to talk about this and see what you guys have to think. Uh, before we get into this, guys, post up your questions. Um, any question posted before 11 a.m. before we start the video has a chance to win a T-shirt and a hoodie and or a hoodie. And, um, you know, if you're new here, there are no dumb questions, no stupid questions, just awkward questions, weird questions and questions you probably shouldn't ask in public. But you can you can post up your questions. Don't be shy. Uh, we will stay on as long as you have questions. So we're going to do a quick topic and then we're going to dive into the questions. This is by Nick Tuminello. So Nick is Nick is not a goofball. Um, Nick is a respectable name in the industry. And uh, this is so I thought I would post this article up because it's not just by, you know, a random voice on the Internet. Um, so Nick is a, calls himself the trainer of trainers. And look, I know it says men over 40, but you guys are heading for you, you guys that aren't there. You know, you're headed there. And th this is telling you as you get old you shouldn't do these movements. And I, I'm, I'm 55. I still do them. I feel as good as, as ever. So uh, I thought this would be a good topic to discuss. So um, let's dive into the five barbell exercises you shouldn't be doing. And uh, Stan Strength, I want your opinion. Bench press. The problem, if you use any amount of time in the gym, either you or a guy you know will get pain from benching, get shoulder pain from benching. Um, okay. Uh, 
that's that's true to a degree. The solution, the band mm -hmm. resisted push up. Okay, mm -hmm. you can do this exercise, you can a super band, but I prefer <laughs> whatever, whatever. The band I developed, the NT loop, I didn't know he had bands, so I didn't know it was a commercial. Um, why it's better, whatever, I'm not going to get into it. So, what do you think? Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, obviously, the bench press is something that can be problematic. You know, mm -hmm. if we don't work on form, it can beat up shoulders. Do you think it's something lifters as they age shouldn't be using? And what do you think of the solution? Um, to me, I don't think that once you go from 39 to 40, automatically your shoulders just become completely mm -hmm. unable to bench, especially if you have a long history with the movement and um, you have your mechanics down, you have your form down and everything like that. But the issue that I can where I can see some validity to this is where some men over 40, they are like getting back into fitness after maybe 10 to 20 years of not really doing much, uh, whether because of work, family um, and whatnot. And if they've gotten pretty obese and they're over 40, then uh, that's where I found like some issues because having them lie down like um, as you would on a bench can be a bit problematic. But to me, in my opinion, if you have maintained a baseline of health and fitness, there's no real reason besides like preference, in my um, opinion, of why you can't do the bench press. Uh, when it comes to the solution, um, push-ups are great and bands are a great way to add resistance to it. Um, but if depending on if you're like just completely fat, that can like kind of make things a bit difficult there as well. And machines and dumbbells are just as valid and viable as any barbell exercise. Yeah. You know, I didn't, um, I'm going to add that I didn't get, I didn't really even learn what proper bench form was till I got to 40. Uh, mm -hmm. I've just picked up stuff, you know, the bodybuilding magazines and the bodybuilding books back in the day were lay on bench, press bar, you know, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing beyond that really. Um, <laughs> So I didn't even really master the art of uh, passable form until after 40. I will say, you know, as a coach, there are a lot of shoulder, knee, and lower back issues. But if you do not have them, I would not discourage you from using the bench press at all. Um, this is a very this is a case by case va basis, and there's very few people I work I work with that can't do the bench press. With that said. Um, you know, I, I highly value the dumbbell bench uh, because your arms are able to move in a more natural position. I think that needs to be in the mix. And uh, the solution here, band-resisted push-ups, no, nah, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're in your 40s and you're struggling to do the bench, this is going to feel worse in most mm -hmm. cases. Uh, pushing your body weight from, a you know, a starting position most look let's be real uh, most men in their 40s 50s coming back to the game and this is this type of article really is for guys coming back to the game they're going to tend to be a little bit overweight and they're better off starting with dumbbells or a very light barbell i'm not a big fan of this advice for bench at all so let's skedaddle on shall we uh the barbell overhead press now back in my day let me just talk like a, a boomer <laughs> um, back in my day. You know, this, the military press didn't have the degree of obsession. It does not. Mm. Uh, so shoulder pain might limit. Yeah, uh, very much so. Um, lower back issues might really prevent you from doing the military press. So with that established, let's jump right into the solution. Uh, if somebody does have um, uh, a shoulder issue, what do you think? you know, would be the, uh, the solution. Is it the landmine angled barbell half kneeling press? I wouldn't say so. Um, usually if they are having shoulder issues, that typically means they're going to have issues elsewhere in their body as well. And having to get into a kneeling position can be pretty rough on them also. Um, when it comes to direct shoulder work, I tend to prefer like using dumbbells because it's just a lot easier to, um, get a better range of motion for most people and like cut it where you need to and start it where you need to also. And they can move things around during the motion to make it more natural to them. But having to be stuck, I feel like the issue that he's picking with the barbell shoulder press is that you're kind of stuck with a certain implement. You're kind of stuck in a certain range of motion. And I don't think the landmine really solves that. 
Now, I think I'm going to be honest, and this isn't a dig against Nick, but I think this is an awful, awful choice. Uh, you, you take a 40, 50, or even 60-year-old untrained or detrained individual, and you're going to have them kneel. Uh, it's going to beat the living crap out of their knees. Um, mm-hmm. I don't like the kneel anymore. Uh, that, and I just don't think it's the best solution. I'd rather see you do a a seated dumbbell overhead press with the back about 70 degrees with a seated press, you're going to take a lot of pressure off your lower back. You're going to add stability. And, uh, you know, the machine shoulder press, there's a lot of issues with the machine shoulder press. A lot of them are just badly designed and starting at that. Usually you got to really get those arms back in a lot of machines to start the press. So, you know, if that, that works for you, great, but I'd rather see you do dumbbells. Uh, barbell squats, I just posted about this on Instagram. As a coach, I think when I got into coaching, I underestimated, like I had done a lot of powerlifting coaching, but those are lifters that are already squatting deep. I, I underestimated how much the average individual is struggling with the squat. So I like this. I'm a big fan of the, I'm, I'm really like, if I had to go back in time, uh, I would be doing a safety bar squat probably from age 18 just to save my shoulders. Um, front squats may solve the problem. I don't think the front squats are a good I- idea for the back. But the solution, dumbbell elevated split squat. I'll let you uh, take this one real quick. The problem with this one is like after – I'm not saying after 40 that's like incredibly old or anything like that. But if they are untrained and they are older – um balance can become a limiting factor and especially if they've been out of for for quite a while like you'd be well not i'm sure not you but when i started working with more clients when i became like a commercial gym trainer and i was working with clients ranging from 18 to literally 80 years old and getting a wide variety of different clients in there like even those who are working professionals like dentists lawyers and whatnot who were in their 40s like trying to have them balance in any type of way was already like a bit of a like compromising position for them. So having to rely on that is in my opinion, not the best thing to do. Um, But at the same time, I was very much at that point in time biased toward the barbell exercises because it's what I've been using. But I realized like they can't really, like it was really hard for them to connect with that movement. So I started relying on other things. And what I decided to go toward was a goblet squat, which um, I think is a better exercise than a dumbbell elevated split squat. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there, a, a, a goblet squat isn't perfect. You know, you can run through progression pretty rapidly. But if you're new to the gym, it is, a, it, I would say it's a much better place to start than this. Um, the dumbbell elevated split squat, I, I don't like, I don't like, uh, you know, these types of movements. Um, you know, with, unless, uh, until you get your balance figured out, it's basically a lunge, right? And mm-hmm. if you're going to do something like that, you need to start to become proficient at a body weight lunge first. And then I want you kind of holding the weight up here. I don't want the weight swinging at your side or swinging forward as you're lunging forward. And I, I don't know, it's just a really, I, I'm not going to take a 40, 50, 60 year old man and start them on lunging exercises. If you have a shoulder issue, there's a good chance your knees aren't probably the best either, or you're a little bit overweight. So let's move on. Deadlifts definitely can be a problematic lift. Um, you know, we need to get your lower back strong and mm-hmm. I'm just going to take the lead here. Uh, the trap bar deadlift is a great place to start. Uh, you know, if you, you want to get into the deadlift and you're new at the game, my opinion is that if you just spent two or three years doing the trap bar deadlift to build up a base level of yoke and, and uh, core and lower back strength and then started to play with the conventional deadlift, it would be a very, very solid uh, approach. What are your thoughts? Yeah, most definitely. Like it, for clients who are mainly focused on exclusively looking better or um, – just general health, especially in that um, older um, range. I typically stay away from mm-hmm. just the straight barbell deadlift off the floor and will usually res- um, resort to the trap bar or a Romanian deadlift. Um, 
the only reason why I put the conventional in is if the person actually wants to get better at that movement. And the conventional has a very special place in my heart, and it does most definitely like pack on strength and muscle. But at a certain point in time, depending on the individual, how much training experience they've already had, and if they have the desire to do so, those are really important uh, factors determining that. And the trap bar is just, there's very few drawbacks to it for most people. And then if they do want to, if they only have access to a straight bar, a Romanian deadlift can get very similar, if not better results. So um, last exercise, the bent over row, I'm not a big fan of, of this movement at all. In general, mm -hmm. I like the penalty row. Uh, I like to be able to brace off the floor and drive the elbows back. I feel it's a, just a better starting position. That's just my opinion. And everybody has a right to determine for themselves you know what they like um causes back pain you know it's it's a it's a tough exercise to nail down um but it's not a, an extremely punishing exercise um you know it, it definitely can beat up the lower back that's for sure but i'm not sure it's super problematic um but the solution bench supported dumbbell single arm row basically putting a hand on the bench he has knee up. I don't like the knee up because with the knee up, it tends to tends to and not for everybody it can depend on bench height and other factors, but tends to keep the lower back a little bit looser. And mm -hmm. the, the one arm row, uh, you know, is my obsession. I love mm -hmm. this. I love the single arm dumbbell row and it can beat the living crap out of your lower back. Uh, so I'm not sure the bench supported. I like the tripod one hand on the bench so you can really brace your core. So what are your uh, thoughts on this one? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, I don't like putting the knee up on the bench either. I actually learned how to um, dumbbell row from you. <laughs> I actually did not really like that movement at all. But then there's a couple of times where I saw like that video of you. I think you were dumbbell <laughs> rowing like upwards of 200, close to 300 pounds for reps. And I was just like, looking at um, your arms as well. I was like, I should probably do that. Um, so <laughs> yeah. gave that a try. And I really liked um, how you executed the movement, but also liked how you kind of like, op you opened up my uh, willingness to do things not that isn't a three by 10, because I was still new to training at the time. And everything right. was either three sets of five, five sets of five or a three by 10. And then when I saw two sets of 12, I was like, oh, that's not enough volume. I do one set and I was like, oh, wait, this is more than enough. So I just kept doing <laughs> yeah. it. I, so two sets of 12 was very um, good. Now, when it comes to the barbell row, I definitely think that the barbell row is um, a movement that a lot of people can like, you know, they can pass up that movement and not really feel any detriment to it. But another, but one thing I will point out is that I feel like a lot of people try to treat it too much like a deadlift, too much like their squat bench and deadlift, um, where they're just trying to go heavy on it. And I think the barbell row actually benefits more so from higher reps. So instead of loading it up with 45 pound plates, I prefer doing 25 pound plates and doing in that 10 to 15 rep range. I find that to be better. And I tend to program um, barbell rows in that way if they're not dead stop. Um, and I think for most people that can be a, very good supplementary exercise if they are doing Romanian deads or trap bar. So just a final thought and we'll get on to questions and thanks you. Thank you guys for tuning in. And, uh, you know, um, it's, you know, it's very generic advice. Um, and I don't think Nick means to blanket, you know, cover everybody, but you know, if you're an older individual, it doesn't really matter to me if you're older or newer, you really need to, if you're new to the game or returning to the game, you need to work on machines and moderate body weights and dumbbells and then get your barbell uh, lifts up to speed in the periphery. Don't just jump into barbell exercises, you know, killing yourself. So, um, all right, let's stop into things. Stein is first today. Stein is always first on the lot. Well, he was. He had a streak going forever. Uh, good to have you back, Stein. I was actually up working till 1 o'clock last night when Stein got up, and I think you were up late as well. Uh, Instagram always says, like, these fables, like he was just lot on Instagram six hours ago. So I can stalk to see when you guys go to sleep. <laughs> right. yeah i definitely have that problem where i'm just up looking at those reels like they just s s like suck your attention in for some reason i have to really break that habit all right i want to point out something real quick and then we're going to move on if you look up here there's a dinosaur 
Okay. I got my custom baseball glove. I got some kind of a gnome that I got for Christmas. My belt when I was 346. And there's a dinosaur up there. Now, on your side, you have Barney taking a nap over in the corner, I see. Yep, just like having a time on the corner, yeah. So um, can you give us a little bit of insight into <laughs> your Barney obsession? Oh, I'm just a huge fan. Like, I've been a fan of him since I was a kid and just never left me. Uh, uh, but no, like, so what happened was um, Bald Omni Man held a live Q&A. And he, like, I just showed up in the in there, like, sent a, like, hey, how's it going kind of, like, message. And he said, hey, look, Stan Strink, like, he's, uh, he breaks things down Barney style. And then, style. yeah, like, so what I was just like, the hell is that? I guess it's a way of like saying like he, um, like putting things in an easy to understand way. I, at least I would hope so. I'm gonna take the positive road on it. Well, that's better than Teletubby <laughs> style, just far yeah, from yeah. Not anything. Yeah. So then, my next video, I release a video where I'm in the thumbnail. It's like like your you on this program and it's like Barney and like his, how he usually looks kind of like, you know, kind of flabby, kind of chubby. But then right next to him was like a really jacked version of Barney. And right. then my parents thought it was like hilarious. So they got me like a Barney plush and then like for some reason. So now I just keep it in there. Yeah. Or yeah. Right some there. nighttime snuggies. You're all good. Yeah, exactly. You know, like we all need some hugs at night. <laughs> uh, Christos, I'm loving the new updates and updates on traditional splits. What's next? So I've been doing some stuff. I got the lube, which is basically the upper, lower, upper posterior, where I took it into two upper days and a a lower and a back day. I'm just showing guys different ways to break down splits. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a junk day where I'm basically showing guys you can kind of remove pieces and parts and just have a relaxing arm, rear delt, cab, ab, whatever day. What is next? I got some um, workouts coming up next. One of the things I'm going to be working on is a modernized, more manageable form of demon training by Trevor Smith. Trevor Smith was a monster. If you search Trevor Smith bodybuilding, you're going to get a monster. Like this dude was a monster. He was like the modern day Vic Richards. You know, he was like, he makes Mr. Olympians look, look small. Let me know if you got a picture of him. Um, okay. But he's no longer with us. But, um, he had a, a system of training called demon training, which was, okay, let's get to failure. And after that, we're going to kick you in the balls over and over with post failure, slow reps, all this kind of drop stuff. I mean, it was just like, man, I was giving me a stroke reading it, but um, I always liked the unique train. Have you ever run into this guy? Uh, no, this is my up first time hearing about him. But I, I'm looking at a picture of him right next to Ronnie Coleman, and he's even making Ronnie Coleman look a, a bit small. <laughs> yeah, I think Trevor Smith was over 400 in the off season. Oh, wow. Um, I, I got a picture of him, and I'm going to uh, – hold on, guys. I'm going to try to load the image and see if I can get it up. Anyway, I'm going to be doing a, a, a an updated um, – you know, because Trevor didn't get any play. You know, he, he didn't uh, – he didn't really – it was just super um, – I'm just trying to upload it here. He was super obscure. You know, no one really knew about him. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just trying to see if I'm able to – I don't want to upload that. Uh, let's see. Where is he? And, and But his, his type of training was really, really ridiculous. And um, let me go to Google, Trevor Smith. It's kind of crazy to me how there is, like, a good amount of really, like, impressive physiques that existed out in the world that people that have never heard about. Uh, one of my favorite underrated or, like, less well-known is uh, Kenichi Suemitsu. He was actually called, like, the Japanese Arnold just because he actually had very similar proportions, but, of right. course, at a um, smaller height. <laughs> yeah, right. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, man, there's so many tabs. There we go. Can I share this? Wow, that's tiny. Can you see him next to Jay Cutler? <coughs> I yeah, mean, yeah. not only is he like about, you know, nine inches taller than Jay. Mm -hmm. I, I stood next to Jay when I was at Muscle and Strength. And Jay's maybe 5'8", five, 5'8 eight, five, eight and a half. So mm -hmm. he's not a giant. But, um, you know, Trevor Smith, that's Trevor Smith, you know, probably at like 370, 380. Yeah. 
So anyway, I'm going to be working on a, a new version of Demon Training. And then I got a system called Massive Rage, which I'm putting together. Just some different concepts and ideas. And um, all right. Hey, Massive family, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. Member of Team Massive. Harut, I've noticed an exponential growth in the number of guys squatting barefoot. Where is this coming from? You know, I'll let you hop on this one, but barefoot scares me because the mats, you know, and foot sweat and slipping. Mm -hmm. Not a big fan of the concept. Am I just uh, old and grumpy or, or uh, do, you, do you like the idea? I mean, in a commercial gym setting, I definitely agree with you. Nah, just, yeah, man. Keep like, those ugly toes holstered. Yeah, yeah. Put them away. Like, um, like that's that, like that's first and foremost. Like, if you're in a commercial gym, yeah, don't be doing that. Like, in a home gym setting, I mean, I get it. But I feel like if you're squatting barefoot in a home gym, it's more likely because you're at home. You can be lazy. You can be a bit gross. And it's not because there's any magical benefits um the barefoot community because the barefoot kind of like movement is very popular in running so uh, have you come across that like i know you're like yeah there's some guys that go in sandals and stuff you know they don't yeah, go, yeah. Whole, uh cory whatever from that survivor show but <laughs> yeah but like that whole like barefoot shoe like zero heel drop and like very minimalistic sole i know that mm -hmm. like they try to advocate that because you're um able to spread your toes more and whatnot you have a better connection with the ground and all these other things which you know if it feels better to you that's all i'll say is like that's really what matters most but i really wouldn't put too much like backing behind it more than that so yeah, i just think people are gross <laughs> yeah well number one i don't like there's two things i don't like to see on social media someone's toes and someone's inside of someone's mouth like i'm done with that we don't need to go get that mm. intimate but um, my main concern is is slipping like if you start to sweat, it's really easy to do a, a skid on wood or even on, uh, on gym mats. Um, you know, you if I always like chucks, but when you do a squat in a, a flat soled shoe, you need to make sure your toe box of your shoe doesn't allow for a lot of sideways movement. But that's not going to be an issue really uh, if your squat is pretty solid. When you do a knees in squat, when you go down, your heels start to come up on the outside as your knees go in, and then you get some weird rolling. So where did it come from? I have no idea in the yeah. lifting community. There's always some guy out there doing stuff. Like the knees over toes guy for a while was like on the little side of the radar, and people started picking mm -hmm. his stuff up, and then it was like a wildfire. It just blew up. Horseman, three two 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 two. Do you think ripito squats are worth it? Or is it better to move to high bar for novice? I'm, you know, I have a very strong opinion about this, but I'm going to let you uh, start. <laughs> um, I think when I, whenever I program squats for new lifters, I prefer a squattier squat version. So, uh, if we are going through a progression, then obviously just body weight squats, mm -hmm. goblet squats, SSB high bar because an ssb squat is essentially um a very similar bar position <laughs> to a high bar um so i prefer high bar for most people because i think what they're trying to get out of a squat is quads so i wouldn't really do um low bar which is really the in my opinion the intent of a low bar squat is to get the most out of um the most weight you can lift or maybe if you are a female lifter then i think that can benef benefit you more because you can build more glutes and hamstrings from what i've seen what are your thoughts on that uh, first off, Horseman, I'm going to give you a T-shirt or a hoodie uh, because uh, the name is new, and I appreciate the question. So you can head over to Instagram at Ben the Barman, slide into my DM, um, and uh, I will send you either a T-shirt or hoodie, or you can email me BenTheBarman at gmail.com. So you need a starting point, like when you're on the internet, you know, you can have these ridiculous arguments, uh, and, and and things get really ridiculous and heated, but. When you coach, you need a system, a starting point. So for most people, to keep mobility simple, uh, you're going to show them how to do a high bar squat. But before you do that, you really need to use like a goblet squat to teach people to let their knees open. The One of the worst habits that develops with squats is the knees in or knees forward. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to un, unfuck, excuse the honesty. Um, 
I have a video on this channel, two of them called Pick Up the Quarter, which is a drill where I teach folks in person how to squat naturally for their body uh, limb links and leverages in like 20, 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, no, it's not. Uh, the the Ripito squat, back in the day when I was powerlifting, I never saw anybody do a Ripito squat over 500. I just don't think it's great for powerlifting, but that's, that's, if you're that strong, you get to determine, you know, what works for you. For mm -hmm. the average individual, I, I don't, you know, there's no one way to squat. That's a ridiculous concept. And if you talk to any experienced strength coach, they're going to agree. That's not a bash on Ripito. That's a reality. And anybody that says there's one way to do things as far as the squat, um, you know, you might want to rethink that strong stance. Yeah, I agree. And especially like, I think one misconception people have is that they think, oh, if I do this, like, egg, like this way of doing things, I'll become an advanced lifter. And one thing I truly believe is that an advanced lifter, they, be they've become an advanced lifter because they learned enough about themselves to know, like how to squat for their build for their preferences for how they like to train. And that's why they're an advanced lifter. It's not because they're all those other things they're trying to like so that's why people try to copy advanced lifters thinking they'll become them but no advanced lifters became that way because they studied themselves the three biggest things i have to deprogram uh lifters from are knees in on the squat a super wide or a wider stance than they should be doing um and and low bar uh, you see a lot of low bar wide stance when your mm -hmm. knees are or your foot your feet are out wide and your your foot angle is wide your knees have to go at that same angle and that's not something most people can do mm -hmm. definitely um e frandy it's TikTok. new generation are obsessed with training optimally <laughs> yes uh and optimally is in the real world optimal is a 10 month journey of or 10 year journey of hell mm-hmm they also do a lot of unilateral work. I will say um, I like to program in one unilateral exercise per body part. I think there are some benefit when you do things unilaterally. The one side is stronger as mm -hmm. an individual than the whole. There's some science behind this that shows that, you know, when you use one side, it actually recruits a greater amount of neuromuscularly, neuromuscularly, uh, <laughs> So that's why you can one arm dumbbell row like 300 pounds and you can only barbell row 400. So there's mm -hmm. an argument to be made for some unilaterals, but overuse is just uh, overkill. Yeah, I agree. And one thing I'll say too is as like since op training optimal and then unilateral work are kind of both in this um, statement, um, I actually did at the most minimal amount of unilateral work since I started training. And I mm -hmm. think that I've done pretty well so i when it comes to it being more optimal i think there's like if you just commit to whatever you're doing and like give it true honest like hard effort uh that like optimalness of uh if that's even a word which it's not of unilateral work can get um ironed out pretty well in my opinion yeah i mean it's completely optional you know, mm -hmm. the only unilateral exercise I really did heavily uh, my first 30 years of training was the one arm dumbbell row. And I didn't do it because it was a unilateral exercise. Yeah, yeah. So you, you don't need them, really. Um, Amanda P, shoulder irritation when upping weight on dumbbell bench. Do I need some, do I use the same weight longer? It's usually not going to fix the issue. The first thing you need to do is look at form. Um, what's the cause of the shoulder issue if it is something that's just general wear and tear it might be time to consider like a bench press slingshot or support device so i don't know uh amanda if you want to send me a video i'd be happy to look all right yeah. research. sorry go ahead oh sorry about that yeah like when it comes to like very similar what i usually do is like i don't think that just staying at the same weight where you're already running into some issues is going to help like same as you said um one thing i also do is like experiment with like back downs where you actually back like drop the weight a little bit but also change like like experiment with different angles and stuff too like i think taking some time to just work on that can be beneficial for some people but then also if you're not including things like you know that prehab and rehab work that people like think is like 
God's gift to mankind. Um, there are times when it becomes more relevant and more necessary. And if this is that point in time, then it's worthwhile putting in. But just trying to get ahead of it can be sometimes a waste. One of the issues uh, as well, and I'm not saying this is the issue, Amanda, but it could definitely come into play, is that people think if they do everything optimally, there's never going to be aches, pains, tweaks, strains, niggles, twiggles, and all this kind of stuff. If you're getting strong, if you're going to spend 10 years in the gym, there's going to be times where things are irritated. If you're not getting irritated in some way, you're probably not training hard enough. I'm not encouraging reckless training, and I'm not saying all you know, irritation is good irritation. Certainly not. But we have to kind of be able to discern, hey, did I just push hard? And like the muscle is not the only thing you're strengthening in the body. You have connective tissue, uh, your central nervous system, you know, all, all this stuff is part of the journey. So is it, you know, we have to kind of dig through the, the rubble a little bit and see what is causing the irritation, if that makes sense. Paul, go team massive. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, three days grace strength standards for strict curl man i'm so disconnected with the strength curl as a power lifting lift do you have any idea i got to 135 yeah, no. by five and that was like <laughs> enough for me yeah like i think we've seen like the thing is like i've seen videos of people strict curling 225 but it wasn't a strict curl when you really like look at it okay. so um when people try to chase it i mean the most important thing this is a. Uh, um, from basement bodybuilding and one thing that I really like what he said progression over performance so when they hear strength standard for um, strict curl they'll just think okay I need to bum rush my way to um, a 225 strict curl which is incredibly difficult to do but they're not really prioritizing like you know the plus ones the consistent training efforts the um, week after week of just putting in that work I'm a big fan of curl variations that force you to slow tf down mm. the fuck down like uh tw 21s drag curls um you know just a higher volume i don't feel like the connective tissue from the bicep into the uh elbow is the sturdiest you know and meant mm. for a lot of beating so i like to get relatively strong uh but you know this end strength chasing the end strength on curls that just scares me yeah, yeah. I feel like it'll let you sing worth the squeeze there. Um, what do we got? Yes, finally got through. <laughs> so you know, I'm glad I'm glad you did. Vinny P, what's up? Vinny P is a client of mine. Um, I think I'm going to keep this drop going unless I notice a real big loss in strength. Uh you mean as far as body weight drop? Yeah, eventually you're gonna hit a loss in strength. Um, you know, it's just part of the game, but uh, it's not anything to fear. You know, you, it's easier to get it back than it is to get it in the first place. So, Richard Murray from Scotland. This weekend doesn't start until massive live. You got that right. Have a great weekend. Thanks. I appreciate it, Richard. Otherwise, I think a 1,000-pound frame pickups at 220 would be nice. Yeah, man, the leaner you can get strong, the better. I mean, I was close to a 2,000-pound total close. I didn't get there, and I'm not going to pretend I did. Uh, at 346, but I felt much better getting a 1650 pound total at at 240, even though that's relatively weaker. It just felt better. Mm -hmm. uh, Stein says, "Welcome, stand." Thank you. And uh, what are we at? CL Young, I sent you a question on Instagram before the live started. Just wanted to let you know. Let me pull that up real quick, so you guys just hold on one second. Let's see. Instagram is uh, super funny. Messages. Request. Chris Young. My question about uh, my questions almost never show up on your live. Uh, my question is, have you noticed any difference in using vegan protein, basically aminos versus whey and muscle building? No, because uh, honestly, you know, that it's it's 20 to 25 percent. Was that vegan protein or vegan protein powder? Let me let me make sure. Using vegan protein, um, I, I've had clients that were vegan bodybuilders. I've interviewed vegan bodybuilders. If you know what you're doing, I don't believe it's problematic. Uh, you know, the key with veganism 
is you really need to know what you're doing so it's not problematic so i, I have not noticed anything um have you met have you messed around uh, with anybody uh stan that's doing vegan heavy uh protein uh not right. vegan heavy i mean there's only one way to do vegan so it's <laughs> <laughs> um only a couple times and they tend to struggle with getting an adequate amount of protein because one thing i will say with vegan at least from a practical standpoint is just that it's a bit more expensive honestly <clears throat> like uh the cost to get the nutrition and um the amount of protein and other micro and macronutrients can get a bit pricey for some people whereas you know meat is very much full of a lot of things we need. Yeah, you know, I post a lot of stuff on uh, Instagram about, um, you know, farming and regenerative farming. And uh, I hate to call it the vegan agenda because it's not a vegan agenda. It's not an agenda by vegans. Mm. It's all these major, like most people don't know that 90% of the food chain is controlled or operated by uh, something like 10 corporations. Mm-hmm like PepsiCo and Taco Bell, correct me if I'm wrong, Taco Bell and KFC and Frito-Lay mm-hmm. and all these kind of drinks. Uh, so there's huge profits in processed food. Mm-hmm. Um, it's health issues aside, but there's no real profit in meat and eggs. So there's a lot of propaganda and nonsense that pushes people down a path that they're not ready to you know, if somebody wants to go full vegan, like I have, ve- I have vegan friends that are full vegan and they don't rely on processed food. You know that, the, hey, whatever works for you. I know mm-hmm. there are possible downsides, but anyway, sorry to ramble. Uh, Lel Traco, best ratio for aesthetics body. Uh, I would say two like to that. one aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like the Steve Reeves type of ratio? Uh, if you guys are wondering about like true ratios, you know, of like, you know, shoulders versus waist and all that kind of stuff, just Google the Steve Reeves uh, body standards. None of us will ever get there because we're too much of fat asses. We're not lean enough. We don't have enough mass. But if you're like the 1% of the 1% and you're micro dialing in things, you know, there you mm-hmm. have it. Aberrant, as a beginner, how do you know when your muscles are ready to be worked again after the gym? Uh, feel? No. Uh, fuck your feelings. No. Um, stick to the plan. Use a wisely devi- devised uh, plan. And if you feel extremely sore or extremely run down or extremely sleepy, add in an extra rest day. Yeah, so. that's that's great advice. Like I like the fuck the feelings part the best. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna stay at the same weight until it feels lighter. No, it ain't gonna happen. Mm-hmm. But th- that was actually know, advice. Oh, sorry to cut off. No, go ahead. Oh, that was actually advice. Like I remember when I was, I had a plateau at around like 405 with my deadlift when I was like uh, still getting, like still building my base <laughs> up. And then I watched a video of yours saying like 405 feels heavy because 405 is heavy. It's go up and weight. <laughs> so then right. I was just like, all right, let me add um, tens on both sides. And then just the very next week after watching that video blew, blew that thing up. And that's why I think mindset is a very important part of uh, any pursuit. Yeah, you have to focus on form, not on feel. Um, you know, mm-hmm. like, and this is off the, off the topic a little bit, but when I really discovered the sport of powerlifting around 2007 and I started to chase strength, not just hypertrophy, uh, you know, you would do your warm up sets and like four or five feels heavy on deadlift because it's a lot of weight. It's 405 pounds. And unless you're like the world's strongest man and ripping 1200, you know, in a, a car deadlift or whatever, you know, then that 400 might feel light to them, but it's never going to feel light to us. Mm-hmm. Us mere mortals. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Uh, Poise Loik. Excuse me if I, I, I bonked your name. Is there a need to cycle training volume? No. Um, or you can just stick to seeing. You evolve. Basically, in the trenches, you evolve volume. And you don't do it on a macro level. Like, I'm going to take leg quads from 12 sets to 10 sets. That's arbitrary. If you're mm-hmm. in the gym and you're like, man, I want one more set of hacks. I like it. I feel like I get something out of it. Or one less set of leg extensions. 
it's more micro. Any thoughts on this, Stan? Yeah, definitely. Like, I feel like um, oftentimes, like, we feel like there are hard numbers that we need to hit for, especially for volume for some reason. Right. Um, but I feel like if your effort is there, and so if your effort and recovery especially is there, you can auto-regulate things pretty easily, where some days, like, you do your, like you said, like, with the hack squat example, maybe you do three sets of 8 to 12, and then one day you just feel incredibly well, and you do a fourth set, a fifth set. That kind of takes care of, like, your needs for that point in time. And then another week, like, you're not feeling the best. And then three is enough. Maybe um, two is good enough. And... I feel like people are just so scared to deviate from those arbitrary numbers just because a certain study was put out or, um, you know, their favorite YouTuber said that that's the most or even worse, their favorite TikToker said that that's how you have to build muscle. Yeah. As far as cycling volume, what the way you guys need to think it is, uh, think of it is like when you hop on a program, the first two to three weeks is going to be a, a break in period where your body is acclimating to the demands of the uh, program. And then you need about three, maybe four months of running with the program um, because, you know, that's when the magic happens. And during that time, you know, you should be bulking, whatever you're bulking, two, two and a half, maybe top end three pounds a month. And then after that, probably a good time for a reset. But c- cycling volume in that context, there's there's no need, that, that keyword need, there's no need to cycle volume. Mm-hmm. If you want to get create an elaborate program where you cycle volume and do like triple progression volume cycles and whatever, great. But at the end of the day, if you like it, do it, but it's not going to provide any benefit. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Uh, Big Johnny Walker. I'm skinny. How can I get body like Brock Lesnar? Um, I would say probably a thousand milligrams of test uh, human growth hormone. I don't know. And, a, and approximately two gallons of milk a day. One is and, not enough. Yeah, and to uh, and take genetics from Brock Lesnar's mama and splice <laughs> them into yours. Uh, if you recover from 15 sets for a body part in a week, but stop at 10, how much? This is all theoretical bullshit. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not jabbing at you, but it, these are these theoretical nonsense questions that, you know, they're not real world. They're not, Mm -hmm. they're just theory and there's no way to solve them because you're, you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. If you're in the gym and you can recover from 15 hard sets, uh, you know, but you stop one workout doesn't mean crap, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, it's not like you're leaving any gains on the table because you have to look at things over the course of five or six years Honestly, Stan, 90% of people aren't consistent uh, for, yeah. for five, six years and train hard enough for this to ever be an issue, correct? 100%. That's why some people gave me flack for one of the novice programs I put out because it's only it's only like 10 sets a day. 10 sets a day because I like my logic is um, 10 sets, four exercises, like put as much effort into each of these exercises in each of these sets and you'll be fine. And people are just like, no, that's too little volume. That's not enough this. That's not enough that. That's just like, run it. Trust me, you'll do better. And then the ones who actually took that leap of faith and said, like, I actually felt better from it. I like, I was just like, good. It's because you're actually working hard. So, like, that's more important than, like, 10 versus 15 versus 20 sets. It's, yeah, it's like, better to awesome. start low and then to work up than it is to start high and to try to b- dial down. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say this is a non-issue is because – this would only be an issue if, uh, well, it would only be a theoretical issue if you did this for three years. Mm. You know, for three years you undertrain. But still, if you are doing 10 hard sets consistently for three years, you know, you're pretty much going to be on the fast track of gains anyway. Mm-hmm. Like one thing I was, I guess, guilty of thinking was um, I need to make sure I do a lot of accessory or bodybuilding work after my main movement. And one thing I've actually experiment, experimented with lately when I was doing or when, yeah, when I did full body for an extended amount of time, I just did one exercise for a certain muscle group and I just did it as hard as possible. And that was enough. And I actually did see results and gains from it. So I was just like, huh, spreading out the workload versus doing it all in one day. 
they both work. It's just a matter of like, which one can I apply the most amount of effort and intention to? And I just found that it was easier for me to do that on the full body. But if I was like, if I am able to do that on upper lower, I would think it's going to work the exact same way. Right. Three days, Grace. Hey, it's Stan Strength. Natural roids. Natural roids. I, I skinny. How I get body like Tom Hanks and Castaway. I don't know. Is that the accent we're going here for? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I see a kangaroo, so maybe like something a bit more Australian, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, I think it's interesting how... Uh, who is like, Lu Xiaojun? Oh, Lu Xiaojun. Uh, he's the uh, Olympic weightlifting guy, the guy everyone does like Lu raises for, like where they do lateral raises all the way over their head. Oh, yeah. What you yeah. do is you take his mom's genetics and splice them into yours. Mm -hmm. and that's the best way uh bill monte welcome stan strength hello team massive haven't squatted hard due to a low back in eight months uh did 225 by six posted on a massive yet uh, today uh how realistic is 295 in a year 100 realistic mm -hmm. there's no reason you can't get that in a year unless you get injured 100 mm -hmm. i think people uh not saying that this is what happening with him but it's very common for people to undershoot what is realistic like for whatever reason, realistic is just a, a a word to say low end of expectations. I guess I don't know. When your squat is below four hundred, uh, and, and not many people get to four hundred, but when your squat is below four hundred, uh, it's realistic to see a fifty pound increase on your squat uh, at any level. You know. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on the seal row? I actually, Vinny P. I had a client. Uh, I'm going to let you go first, Stan, and then I'll I'll talk. I'll do my story. <laughs> I like the concept of a seal row, but in execution, in most gyms that I go to, it's just incredibly hard to set up. Um, you either don't have benches that are big enough. Um, you have to put you have to take a lot of plates from other people just to put them underneath the bench to set up a seal row. If you have a machine for it or if you have a bench station that's uh, conducive for it, I think it's great. If you're training in a home gym setting like also a very good exercise. That's just the practical side of it. Now, let's say like all those things excluded, I think it's a very good motion for your upper back, rear delts. Um, I'm not fully convinced it's the best for the lats, but um, I do think that it does have like great benefits for um, not taxing your lower back, which is the big issue with why barbell rows are not popular anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I have a client that um, was looking for home gym uh, options, and this guy's like a MacGyver. He he built a leverage squat in a squat rack. Mm. You know, this this guy's like naturally adept at uh, you know engineering. So uh, I gave him the seal row, and he knocked it out. Uh, created a, a solid platform. It's it can be a good lift. Um, it, for some, it can be a good lift for back feel, uh, but you just have to kind of, it, it can be kind of a pain in the ass to set up. So I have nothing against it. It's one of those lifts like seated cable rows and machine rows and stuff. You have to just chest support rows. You have to decide whether you like it or not. Yeah, I think some people need to also factor in convenience when they program for themselves. Like, uh, I think a lot of people will like something I've seen is like, I've been doing I want to do these exercises, but it takes me 30 minutes to do it in the gym, like just to set it up. And right. they only have an hour to work out. It's like, uh, unfortunately, at this point in time, it's probably not worth it. That's one of the biggest issues with home gyms that really starts to aggravate you is mm -hmm. when you want to move from one exercise to the next. And um you you can't because you got to take like i hopped in the gym yesterday and i'm like okay i'm gonna lead off with dumbbell rows because i moved from a program that did deadlifts on a hamstring day to uh, uh a, a back day mm -hmm. and um i'm like oh there's only 30 pounds on the dumbbell now i gotta spend a half an hour loading the dumbbell and then mm -hmm. i gotta do, load the warm-up set and then do that and then load the working set and do that like at some point you know like convenient inconvenience drives you to spend more and more money at your home gym <laughs> <laughs> and uh i don't know like i have a chest supported row where i pull mm. uh horizontally in my home gym and i find that nice. basically the same thing as a seal row just cheaper and less of a headache oh 100 yeah 
Natural roids, I have a one inch range of motion on competition arch bench, and I have nothing else to do but to post nonsense questions on massive iron all day long. You get fat. Yeah, that's the right answer. <laughs> Kick rocks. Uh, but um, no time for bullshit. Any tips for, for calisthenics? Honestly, man, this is going to sound dismissive. And I'm not trying to be dismissive, but uh, that's not my game. I'm not going to be one, one of these YouTubers. I'll be like, you ask me any question on anything, I'm going to give you an expert opinion because I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> Right? No, I don't know jack squat about calisthenics. I've uh, I've looked at books. Mm. I've studied Never Gymless by Ross Animate. That's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, if you can find that book, it's a treasure trove of uh, information. You can check out my buddy on Instagram, Mech Animal. My buddy on uh, YouTube, Mech Animal. Uh, there's some legit smart calisthenics guys, but this ugly face is not one of them. Uh, Stan, do you ever mess around with calisthenics? Um, it was how I first got into training um, because I didn't have, like, when I started working out, there was, like, the apartment gym. I had that for about a year. But then for a two-year span, I didn't have access to a gym at all, but I didn't want to stop working out. So I did two years worth of calisthenics, and I didn't really get into, like, all the skill stuff because, like, when I see calisthenics, I always think, like, are you talking about, like, the skill stuff, like the levers, the planches, and all those other, like, uh, words that sound French? um and uh, i just i never got into those but when it comes to like just basic pull-ups push-ups dips inverted rows and whatnot my general answer is just just do more like like uh, it's one of those things where the more volume you can put into it it does work out much better than it translate volume translates better there than it does in the weight room like when you're using right. external resistance but that's why like calisthenics i'm just so far removed from it i'm just like just do more if you're just focused on that yeah, I mean, um, you know, when it comes to push-ups, do more. That's my solution. When mm -hmm. it comes to pull-ups and things like that, uh, sometimes if guys are struggling, we'll do block work where, mm -hmm. you know, go in, see how many you can do in two minutes. Maybe you get 13 next time. Maybe you get 14. It's easier to add a rep in a time block, a rest pause time block, mm -hmm. than it is to add one rep to a set. So. Yeah, I've been using I, I've used that before and that one worked really well for me right now. What I'm using, I'm actually using like a rep goal, um, but I'm actually but I'm not holding it to a certain like number of sets. So for me right now, I'm doing 25 total reps of pull ups and I try to get it down under three sets. And once I hit below three sets then I'll up that rep goal. But right now it's taking me about like five, six to get um, 25 total reps. I want to show you guys something real quick uh, because I mentioned a name uh opera savings automatic cue not now nah, what are you doing opera i'm right in the middle of a live and it sends me a pop-up it's never done that before um let's share the screen i want you guys to go follow if you're just even if you're not into calisthenics uh ross is uh somebody to follow um let me see if i can get this up here so ross had a book called never gymless he's more into boxing and martial arts these days but his um his home gym here, he does a lot of non-conventional, uh, unconventional work, you know, um, not your typical barbell and dumbbell programs. Even if he's using barbells and dumbbells, he has a lot of unique ways that he trains the body. And uh, his book, um, let's see, Ross and I made never gymless. If you can find it. Uh, this book right here, uh, RossAnimate.com, it's a monster. It's literally a monster book. And, uh, <laughs> probably the PDF, I would imagine. But I had the hard or the, the soft cover um, book. It's thick, and it's just packed with information. That's nice. So if you're, uh, if you're serious about lifting or just calisthenics, you got to check that book out. All right, where are we you doing okay, Stan? I don't want to keep you on here forever. We're rolling. Nope, I got all the time. Yeah, I got all the time in the world. Uh Liz fit Liz lifts base stand strength. Uh that's that new kid lingo. <laughs> yeah. JP, how does my stand? Uh how? Can't really answer, but why? Maybe I have one, but I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know how 
your does my, mm. but, um, you know, the reason is because you enjoy it. I think you that's know, really what matters at the end of the day. Yeah. Just do what you enjoy. Uh, Sebastian, how do I get the calf muscles and shins used to long distance running? Um, you know, when I got into uh, endurance running, everyone's like, fat boy gonna die, fat boy gonna die, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, you're gonna get injured, you're gonna get injured. It's like, I felt like I was in a Christmas story. You're gonna shoot your eye out, kid. You're gonna shoot your eye out. And then what I found was that 36 years of strengthening my connective tissue and tendons and, and everything, mm -hmm. uh, I never got injured, never. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a lot of it's luck. That's not law. You know, let's not mm -hmm. pretend it's not. But how do you get used to it? Repetition, 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 and strength. That's the only thing I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, when I That's first started point. running, I, I used to get shin splints and calf issues. All I can say is repetition, patience, rest, and strength. Anything to add to that? Yeah. Like, I'm, one thing I'll say is like, there's never any meaningful pursuit that doesn't come with like its own like aches and pains like how you mentioned earlier like everything will have like its own like uh niggles and tiggles and whatnot mm -hmm. so um if it's worthwhile um how do i get my calf muscles and shins used to it you just you more likely have to mentally adapt to the fact that it's just gonna happen yeah and half this battle is you know like it's really cool to go beef mode. Let's go beast mode and never rest and no days off team, no days off. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's horse shit. You need to, you need to listen to your body and rest, you know, um, push, rest, push, rest, push, feeling good. Push again, rest, you know, don't, don't, don't push yourself to the point where you get beat up, relax, be patient, play the long game. Uh, Roy Scarvin definitely prefer the barefoot just feels better. Neo what's going on, Neo? Thanks uh, for joining and welcome to the party. Uh, mine young, your young, we all cream for mine young. I don't know what I, that's, that's over my head. <laughs> I'm not creaming. Uh, we all, I would say not true. Uh, hello. Do either of you find any use for kettlebells? Uh, I like looking at them. I like the idea. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that looks like a really cool, uh, cool idea. I actually bought my first kettlebell uh, this month. And mm. it's still sitting in the corner of my gym going, hey, I like the look of you. I like the mm -hmm. idea. But can they replace the barbell overhead press? Well, a single arm a kettlebell is a good lift. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I'm not an either or guy. I'd rather see you doing a barbell and a single arm kettlebell overhead press or double arm kettlebell overhead press or whatever. So Stan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually did a, um, every minute on the minute, like, uh, like conditioning session with the kettlebells yesterday. I want to start adding those in more regularly because, um, running, like I, I have a history of like knee and ankle problems, like I actually tore some stuff in both of them. So running can be a bit difficult sometimes. Um, so on those days, I decided that I'm probably going to use like kettlebells, maybe like some cycling <laughs> stuff, but mainly kettlebells. I think they're fun. Um, uh, so I do like them for that. Uh, same thing as you, though. I don't really like the idea that you can replace movements if you have the option to do, do them at least. Like if you have the ability and the option to do a barbell overhead press and you decide to replace it with something else, then I feel like you're having to do a trade off. But if you're in an environment where all you have is the kettlebell, yeah, do a kettlebell overhead press. And that's going to be one of the most important things you can do. It's just kind of context dependent. Now, I want to throw out this question. And anybody that answers at the end is going to have a chance to win a T-shirt or a hoodie. We're going to throw a bonus round. So, you know, we're in the fitness community. And over the years, and this is just my deal, there's been things that I wanted that look really cool. That I really would like to invest time in that. Like um, over the years, I'm like, man, I would really love to become proficient at kettlebells. That looks like a really cool thing. Or man, uh, you know, I, I would love to do this martial art just for fun. Uh, you know, other physical things, but there's always things in the periphery that I would like to do, but I just don't have time to do. What are some things that you guys that are lifters that wish you had the time to do that you're always like, yeah, that seems like a really cool idea if only I had time. Stan, do you have any of those? Um, yeah. Um, so actually, something I want to do a bit more on my channel is boxing and boxing content because I'm that's one of the my favorite things to do. I do box a lot in my uh, free time and for my conditioning. So 
I do also work with some clients like do pad work and like all that kind of stuff. So boxing is a really big one for me. Um, I also kind of go down that self-defense rabbit hole of things. So wrestling is also another one. So I've been boxing and wrestling, boxing for about two, three years and then wrestling for the past year. I come from a wrestling background, I wrestled in high school. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, I found when I got back from college, man, I wish I, I wish I had done some college wrestling because the, the addition of strength, mm -hmm. I, when I came back home after college with a year and a half of strength, like I went from skinny fat to squatting 315 from mm -hmm. skinny fat to benching 275, which isn't super impressive. But when I wrestled the old guys from high school, like mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was like two levels above them. Yeah. Yeah. Like one yeah. thing I think uh, wrestling really benefits from is that you can use your physicality more in wrestling than you can in most other martial arts. So are you a big uh, MMA fan, UFC fan? Uh, I'm getting back into it now. Um, the last time I really followed MMA and UFC was actually when George St. Pierre was still fighting, <laughs> but I'm getting back into it now. So um, I am going to be watching uh, UFC 278 this weekend. Um, I actually have a couple um, friends and acquaintances actually on that card. So, um, it'll be cool to watch. Yeah. You know, I, um, I got back into a, like two, I was actually in Idaho when the first ones came out, the original UFCs mm -hmm. and I was like early in on that stuff. Right? Yeah. Oh, the hoist Gracie and the sumo wrestler, this stuff's cool, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, like I got back into it about two months ago, I got the, the passes and stuff and, I got spoiled by one of the UFCs. It was just a great card and great fights. Mm -hmm. I got super like I'm gonna get the subscription. This is great. I don't know. And then the next one, you know, you're like watching people dance for 20 minutes and no one's yeah. throwing a punch. And like <laughs> oh, they didn't even go to the mats. Right. Like, Staring intently in each other's eyes, you know. <laughs> oh, get a room, you two. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. you're gonna fight or you're gonna, you know, collect points. I mean, right, yeah. But so it, it varies a lot. Um that's why, like, the thing is, like, with UFC and stuff like that, sometimes it really is more important to put on a good show than it is to, you know, keep your record nice and tidy, I guess. I don't know, man. They're, um, the only thing I'll say is they're, the, the modern UFC has a lot less ground game than I expected. Because, mm. like, early on it was, like, Hoist Gracie and then people kind of um, – you know, kind of evolved and learned how to counter that a little bit and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, martial arts evolved. But, you know, some of these fights are just, you know, the the ones that are – I love boxing. You know, I, I like yeah. the uh, sport of boxing. But, you know, some of these are, like, really bad boxing matches. Mm -hmm. That's true. Like, something I will say is, like, people – think that MMA fighters are supposed to be the peak of like multiple martial arts and that's not always the case sometimes it's just that they're really dominant wrestlers and they can really get you down there or they're incredibly powerful strikers but even then like if you watch if you watch boxers too they're not perfect like the thing is people think that how you drill and how you do certain techniques in practice is how it's going to look like in the fight and that's never really the case your technique is always going to degrade when you're actually in the ring which is why when you are practicing and you are drilling it should look as perfect as possible because it will naturally like if your hands are supposed to be here they'll get lower and lower each like the more intense the fight gets all right with enough of boring you guys with MMA <laughs> talk. Uh, turtle diabetes. I watched your five week peak video yesterday and wanted to ask if there's if that's still how you prefer athletes peak or you use a different method. Uh, peaking for like a, a powerlifting meet or a one rep max attempt. Um, in a perfect world, you want to do a peak. You want to. You have you have two things. You have your strength and you have your fatigue or strength and fitness. So a peak. You're going to slowly back off your assistance work, and it's going to allow your strength to shine. Your strength is going to be a little bit above. Uh, so peaking basically allows you to build some confidence with heavy weight and uh, reduce your fatigue. So in general, I'm a fan, but can it be overthinking for the average gym person just trying to set a PR? Yeah. yeah Have you ever run a strength peak? Um, I have, and – um sometimes i honestly like some of my best prs were just literally on days where i just felt better like i just um intuitively took maybe uh some time off or some accessory work down and then 
got a bit more sleep, ate a bit cleaner and a bit more calories that day. And I was just like, okay, cool. I feel like my working weights like uh, feel in a, incredibly light or I was doing conjugate for quite a while. And, you know, you work up to a daily max. So then on that day, I just felt like I had more in me than usual. So then I hit like almost a 20, 30 pound PR that day. So, but when I did like an actual honest to God peak, um, I found, yeah, just same thing about 20, 30 pound jump from that. Not every lift is the same, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you, you know, if, if somebody's pretty strong and they want a really good peak, I, I want them to reduce some of their fatigue levels a little bit. Mm hmm uh, Neo, is it okay to do lateral raises unilaterally? Yeah, that's what I do with my bulldozer laterals. Mm -hmm. um, I I like, I find I find you get a little bit better leverage, and it's a little bit more sh friendly from a shoulder health standpoint. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really depends on the execution. Now, lateral raises are like it's like when you order a pizza. And you get like, I'm going to get pepperoni and I'm going to get jalapenos and I'm going to get Italian sausage and I'm going to get bacon and I'm going to get meatballs. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'll toss on green pepper. That's like lateral raises, right? You know, <laughs> like uh, they're just kind of the, the thing you toss on at the end of a good shoulder workout. Mm, yeah. Like I'm actually one of those heathens who doesn't really do lateral raises anymore. And like I mainly... For one, I've decided that I actually don't want um, too too much more shoulder mass. Like I'm really focusing mostly on my biceps and triceps right now. But when I do uh, shoulder isolation, I actually just stick to upright rows. Like uh, they don't hurt me, and I actually feel like a lot better from. Them. You're being a heretic. I know. Yeah, <laughs> like my shoulder should have exploded like a year ago. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I don't know how we all survived the the era of never do upright rows, never do leg extensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I like I don't like regular lateral raises. They bore the living crap out of me. If I do them, I do them rest pause style mm -hmm. as a finisher, um, or uh, I will do my bulldoze and lateral variation, which I like more because it's more leverage friendly and gives you some overload. Patrick mm -hmm. Julius. Do you see any value of dumbbell flies for chest? Ah, this is another one similar to the lateral raise. I work out at home, so no access to cables. So I'm going to let you go, and then I'll kind of talk about how I would recommend working them in. Mm -hmm. So for me, I actually remember watching like a certain video from a long time ago that said flies are completely useless. And at that point in time, I did not like flies at all. So I was like, cool, I don't like them and they're useless. I'm just going to focus incredibly hard on my pressing. And I think I developed decent pecs since then. Um, but now that I've kind of matured a bit um, and like having to train like more people and whatnot and trying to, if someone really is trying to get more chest, which was me for quite a while, I added in dumbbell flies and I really like them. Um, once another thing that uh with that too is i think there it might be something to be said about like the weighted stretch being better um not entirely sure on it i'm not gonna like really advocate why that's why it's in there but i never put in flies over my pressing when it whenever did put in my flies um it was just something very much like lateral raises you added in at the end for that extra bit of volume um uh, because it's just a bit easier on the joints i um i've never felt like i don't mind doing cable crossovers but I have found that they're virtually impossible to overload at most mm -hmm. commercial gyms. Mm -hmm. As you go like 20s, okay, that was good. 30s, that was good. 40s, never happening. Um, so I think the dumbbell fly is an okay option, uh, especially for the home gym. But I like to do this type of movement as part of a superset with like mm -hmm. push-ups or dips where you get really controlled on the push-up or dip and feel the chest. I feel it's a good synergy um, flies. We have a tendency to do this arm flared thing mm. where it's, it's better to have the see where my elbow whoops, elbow is relative to my shoulder. Mm. Uh, you want to kind of drop it down and then bring the elbow up. Um, mm. So for that reason, you know, sometimes decline flies, a you know, slight decline. You could put a block of wood under the front of your bench Um you know, a lot of people get aggra shoulder aggravation from flies because That's they're true. like, you know, never moving their elbows and their arms are flared. So I think you really, really have to um, 
make sure you you work out the uh, your form on those so you don't kill yourself. HB, our broad shoulders. Uh, wait, our broad shoulder saver pad bench press useful for strength or muscle building. Um, um, or bench presses. Shoulder saver. Shoulder saver. Um, I, I'm not sure what you know, I mean. I, like the bench blocks, like I think I think maybe that's what he's talking about, like the like board bench presses. Um, maybe board presses, board bench yeah. presses, the mm-hmm. shoulders. Uh, but I, the thing that threw me off is the shoulder, shoulder saver. Saber pad. Pad. Yeah, yeah. Maybe HP. <laughs> maybe you can clarify because that that tossed me off a little bit. Uh, you're not. Hello, we already did that one. Horseman two two two. Thank you for your response. Uh, you, you're welcome. I had problems with good morning squats. Yeah, I mean that's a big issue. You you fold mm-hmm. like a lawn chair. <laughs> I mean, especially if you're you know you don't have the perfect limb lengths and leverages, you'll fold like a lawn chair mm-hmm. or a belly to kind of help you bounce from it. <laughs> yeah, like a Lane Norton squat. No, no disrespect, man, but when he squats, his nipples are on his knees, and like I couldn't do that, I would die. Um, I'm 6'4", 235, muscular, 18, uh, 20%, want to cut 12%. Can I go into it? Yeah. Don't worry about muscle loss. Don't. Yeah. This is mm-hmm. something we need to stop as a community because even most of the modern science shows that if you're training hard, you're not going to lose that much muscle. Uh, natural bodybuilding shows us the same thing. Mm-hmm. Even if you lose a couple ounces, it's going to come back when you stabilize your weight. Exactly. So the fear that you're going to lose like 10 pounds of muscle, it's fairy tale. Anything to add to that, Stan? Yeah, I think the one of the biggest things that gets in the way of most people's fat loss, it's definitely gone in the way of mine many times in my life, where you see either a drop in performance or you feel a little flatter in the mirror, and then oh, you decide like, oh God, I got to abandon ship and like not Uh, do this and you just have to remember what your goal is like if for example um one thing that i had to get used to is like if i am cutting and i don't and like a certain weight doesn't feel right anymore or i don't hit a certain number on like let's say my bench or my deadlift i just remind myself like okay um i'm training in the right direction in the way that matters which is my weight and that's it like i'm gonna be i'm content with that everything else is just like is the effort there is am i putting in the work am i going to like am i going to the gym when i need to and that's more important than anything else so like don't measure weight loss in um like how much like if by how much strength you're losing because then you'll just like want to abandon the diet yeah you know you remember guys i lost 100 pounds and you know, my, my, I lost a lot of strength during that process. And, um, you know, it, uh, it messes with your head. You feel flat, your glycogen depleted, you know, so on and so forth, but just get there, uh, stabilize. Everything does come back. Mm-hmm. Not maybe not everything in strength. If you lose a hundred pounds, but how to overcome workout pain. I just started two days ago. Uh, use one of my programs. Yep, that's a good one. Uh, don't overdo it. No, uh, you don't want to overdo it. When, you, when you're when you starting out at the gym, you don't want to be pushing max rep sets. You probably want to do two training sessions a week for a month just to get in the habit mm-hmm. and just kind of go real moderate and wait and let your body break in. Anything to add to that? Yeah, most definitely. Um, when I was starting out as a personal trainer and like working with new clients and whatnot, I um, I never started them with like, anything close to failure at all like it was just more like um because like one of the first things i would ask them is like when you had a trainer in the past how consistent were you with your sessions and then they said well i buy i buy the package that's four sessions a week and i i like actually got like reamed out by my manager at the time because i like told them no drop down to two days a week like let's just maximize your consistency he said like and there's like i can't really do that like that's uh like we got to make sure they're paying for it i was like all right but um no like do what you can handle. Do what you can commit to. Do what you can make out of, a habit out of. Like that's more important than anything else. Yeah, I'm drooling. So in case you're <laughs> wondering what happened there, um, yeah, I mean when you're starting out, if you've been detrained or untrained or new to the gym, what I tell people is two sessions a week for the first two weeks, uh, super, super moderate, lightweight, no pushing. Just get the feel, get the break in going. You don't want to be so you know debilitated that you can. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, there's no value in that. Uh, mm-hmm. Week three 
if you want to ramp up to three sessions a week. Uh, but you know, you just kind of slow crawl by the end of two months, you're going to be running anyway. So, yeah. Cause I feel like a lot of people, they actually get derailed more often if they feel like they missed or messed up. So if they signed up for four sessions, but they only make two, um, they'll feel significantly worse than if they like signed up for two sessions and hit both of them. So like, it's that habit of winning, you know, Harut, is there such a thing as too slow of weight gain? Yes, there's definitely. You know, we have such a fear of bulking, um, which is grounded in fat bulking, that we can actually – look, I'm going to be honest. I got a couple clients that I really like as people and I like as individuals, but I just really want them to start taking their nutrition seriously. You can't stay at the same weight and expect to gain 10 pounds of muscle and lose 10 pounds of fat and stay at the same thing. This is like Harry Potter stuff. <laughs> you know, you, you know, even if you can gain a couple pounds of muscle, mm -hmm. you know, why do you think the body's just going to work? Like I'm going to gain 10 pounds of muscle, lose 10 pounds of fat. Mm -hmm. But that aside, yeah, there definitely is. Um, I, I stand, I do a 10 pound limit with clients Mm. Like I tell them, two, three, four, five months, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Gain 10 pounds, and then we're going to reassess, see how your training is going. Do you want to go another five, or do you want to do a mini cut? Uh, mm -hmm. So I kind of set a 10-pound limit because that's that's not intimidating. Yeah, that's a very good way of going about things. Um, when it comes to, like, yeah, slow weight gain, like, I do err on that side quite honestly, just because I am guilty of dirty bulking. So I try yeah. to not, um, you know, let that habit uh, extend past myself. So, um, but I, even then, like, I think one pound is the absolute, like, minimum. Like, uh, you should be, like, seeing, like, month to month when you measure everything out, like, at least one pound a month is decent. But some people are even scared of that. Like, they're, they're scared of, like, I, I do have, I've experienced some clients who were scared just from water weight from day to day. Like they think that right. what anything that's added onto the scale is immediately fat. Right. Which is absolutely untrue for anybody watching mm -hmm. uh, the water weight fluctuation is normal, but yeah, you, you have to look at the uh, overall uh, trend of the graph where your weight is going and mm -hmm. that it's best to weigh in twice a week simply to have more data points. Uh, so you overcome those water fluctuations. If I treat laterals as pump work, is there anything wrong with this? So you can do finishers all you want. Um, they just don't replace the bread and butter. If you have any, uh, ex any, 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 any energy, energy at the end of a workout, you can do all the pump, uh, you know, finisher work you want. There's no downside. Definitely. Um, one thing that I've started doing too is like, as I started to get a bit more busy uh, or during those busy seasons of my life, I just put significantly more work in the bread or but bread and butter movements. And that's more than enough. Um, I think sometimes people are prone to saving their energy for their finishers right. and detracting from their main work. I do not program in finishers. I do them when I feel like them. So mm -hmm. if I'm in the gym and I do back and biceps and I, I'm like, man, I'm my pre-workout's really going to town today. I might do a run the rack or run the stack on bicep curls. Uh, sometimes I do 50 rep curls where I just grab 25s and do 50 total reps. But I never program that stuff in. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And there's just scientifically there's not enough, you know, what we know a conventional standpoint is you do not need finishers or pump work to build muscle. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so therefore it's not a necessity. That doesn't mean it doesn't have any benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, just the whole mental attitude of wanting to crush yourself is beneficial, but just 100%. don't elevate them. Yeah. And one thing too, is like, sometimes it's just the novelty of it. Like uh, if you, if it's not something you've done in quite a long time and then you do it like once every now and then when you're feeling great, uh, that novelty can provide benefit. <laughs> Jose, should you take a deload that's built into the program you're running if you don't feel worn out? So I got a little bug flying around here. Um, not, I don't like arbitrary deloads. I'm not mm -hmm. a big fan of arbitrary deloads. I've mentioned this before, Stan. You can tell me your opinion. But if you look at training over the course of a year, I'm going to take off when I'm sick. I'm mm -hmm. going to take off on special events and holidays. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take off on vacation. 
and I'm going to add in a rest day or two when I feel beat up. Mm -hmm. um, now, is it a bad idea to add in a rest week every three or four uh, uh, months? No, it's not a bad idea. There's no downside, but it really depends on the context of your program. Mm -hmm. Super freaking deloading, there's no value. Yeah, I 100% agree on that. Like I I do remember though, I, I did for almost two years program like a deload every third week. Um, part of that though was because I was just very much a fan of high intensity training. So you could like, maybe you can argue it was out of necessity for my bad decision. <laughs> um, but one thing I've noticed that when I switched over to taking deloads as you kind of like recommended, where it's just an extra rest day when needed, um, monitoring my fatigue and making adjustments as time goes on, I found that I actually made much better results. And mathematically, it just kind of plays out that way. Like if you take a deload every, like after your third week of training and there's only 52 um, weeks in a year, that's like at least, you're only getting really like 40-ish weeks of training compared to someone who might be getting 50. And then like over the course of many years, like you'll never really catch up on that. Now, this advice is for the general public, right? The average individual who's trying to get up and build as much mass as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had conversations with Faz where you talk about more late and intermediate, very strong people who find mm -hmm. like every third or fourth week they're feeling flat or having down cycles in their training. Mm -hmm. If you notice that to be the case as a more near advanced strength athlete uh, or just, you know, say you're a muscle head, excuse me, your muscle head and you're pretty strong, but you notice every third or fourth week you're super flat. It might not be a bad idea to start deloading every third or fourth week because mm. then you're in the long game scenario and you, um, you know, you, you, you're scratching out, you know, ounces. So it's yeah. a different game. B. Crow, just got a trap bar. Merry Christmas for you, B. Crow. Uh, thoughts on low grip versus high grip. I'm high grip all the way. You know, I, I you know, if you want a very high grip one week and low grip, uh, go for it. I would start higher grip, adjust, and then maybe work lower grip and stand. Yeah, I'm the exact same way. Like, um, I know that there are benefits or more carryover benefits to your, to if you do low grip. But personally, if you're using a trap bar, I know, I'm not really thinking that you're wanting to get car massive carryover from it. You're trying to use it as a, your main movement. So I'd rather go for the high, higher group. Yeah. The main benefit of a trap bar is you're going to get some relief off your lower back. And if you're just mm -hmm. going to hunch over anyway, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it'll be more over the center of your bar. That's fine. But when, when the bar is lower to the ground, you're going to have to, your torso gets lower to the ground and it's going to be more like a conventional deadlift to be anyway. Mike, mm -hmm. how's it going? Mike, uh, Brendan, if I follow a bro split every day, once a week, how would you set up a shoulder day? What I liked, um, oh, how would you set up specifically? One or two presses and, and three ice. I like to do a dumbbell and a barbell. Mm -hmm. And I like to do either a shoulder press, machine shoulder press, a more powerful high pull, uh, an upright row or a bulldozer lateral, or even mm -hmm. a lateral in rest pause style. Now, if you do not like to, you know, if you're working on building up your work capacity and doing a dumbbell and barbell press in the same workout seems a little bit daunting, you could do one one week, one the next until you build up some of your work capacity. Uh, Stan, how would you do it? Um, me personally, because I just prefer the barbell press. Um, like this is like personal preface thing. Um, I would do barbell overhead press like stand like out in front of you. And then my second pressing movement, I actually really like the behind the neck press as of late. But that second pressing exercise is what I would like vary over time. So when the behind the neck press, I'm not really feeling it anymore or, or what else have you, like not progressing with it or uh, or something of that nature, then I'll switch it out for dumbbells, machines, and something else. Um, and then I like that, like three isolations. That's a pretty good one. But mainly upright rows and then maybe one after that me personally i feel like the more exercises you put in sometimes you have to just really assess like is that additional exercise necessary or can i just get um more out of more effort on other on the other ones already in the program 
Yeah, so some people will say, like, on a body part split, you have a, a rate of decay. You get weaker and weaker, but you have that on full body workout. I mean, yep. it it doesn't matter. It's it's a, an issue in any scenario, and you have to figure each one out individually, how you're going to piece that together. I did BTN presses exclusively for, like, 25 years. Mm. Uh, I wasn't in the naughty boy shame corner and told that they were a bad lift, but when you do them, you want to make sure your wrists are about over your elbows. You don't want to have your wrists out here because then you'll get this really awkward, um, you know, external shoulder rotation. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be like this. You'll get this, I mean, internal shoulder rotation. So wrists over elbows. I never brought the bar lower than my uh, sexy earlobe. <laughs> Not really. Uh, are higher ups better for shoulders? Well, here's the thing. What I have experienced is that, like, one thing we need to understand is every muscle group is different. Mm -hmm. And not every muscle group has the same muscular endurance, stamina. Shoulders, for me, have a much weaker endurance. And I'm going to tell you my GVT uh, story, and, and you can try this, Stan, when you're really bored someday. So in German volume training, I tried it, you know, that one week when we all tried German volume training. And I did my little squatty waddies. I started with 185 and did a 10 by 10. And I, I don't know, I did barbell where I was 10, but bench 10 by 10. Everything going good. And then we got to shoulder day. And uh, you're looking at somebody that did a 315 BTN seated and a 315 seated overhead press. Um, both of those, you know, uh, I did back in my heyday. So I'm like, I'm going to put 135 on the bar and do a 10 by 10. Should be easy, right? No. First one, 10. Second one, 6. Drop the weight to 115, 6. Four set, drop the weight to 95, 5. By the sixth set, I'm doing like the bar, and I can't even get it for 10. Mm -hmm. What I learned and what I have since come to understand is that uh, endurance, muscular endurance in the shoulders is uh, not equal to other – other body parts you got to break in you got you need to <laughs> um my dog actually knows how to open doors but yeah. this one's a pull door so that on the push doors he has no problems but on the pull ones he uh <laughs> has issues so he managed so, to get around yeah i think there's benefit in working uh working towards higher reps for shoulders um but you know that's to build some shoulder endurance and to build some shoulder uh, strength and, and muscle. But I see the door open now. Yep, there we go. There he, he is. Go. Oh, he's got the phone <laughs> of shame. Yeah, because uh, like he's been having like I guess food allergies, so he like bit himself pretty hard and uh, like licking himself pretty aggressively. So I actually I had to apply ointment on him. So I guess he my dog missed the phone. My dog had his balls chopped off last Friday, and he just got rid of his donut of shame today. Uh, I see. Yeah, I think maybe like maybe two, one or two more days on because like the wound is healing pretty nicely. So it should be off pretty soon. All right. So, yeah, a higher reps, you know, I like to do either do like, um, you know, more sets of lower reps or some sets of higher reps for shoulders. You know, you yeah. really take it exercise by exercise. Yeah. Like I, I found something very similar with my shoulders, like um, 135 for a set of like five, like, five to 10 reps, like that's just incredibly difficult for me. But then if you put that into like a one or max calculator, that puts it around like 185 ish, I guess. But I could easily do like two, 205, 225, even though my like, like for singles or like triples, like much easier. All right. We're about an hour and a half in guys. we got about 10 questions. So this is going to be the last call. I'm going to try to breathe through things. So me and uh, Stan can in, urinate. Uh, before we explode, <laughs> Chuck Star, two count press, AG, ATG front squats. Should bias uh, higher or lower rep ranges for this? Well, that's a long pause. Um, the, remember, the, the point of a pause of a squat is to keep you tight and, and keep you kind of focused on staying tight in the hole. Um, you know, so just kind of keep your pause fluid. If you want to do two seconds, that's fine. But I think on a front squat, if you're doing pause, you're going to beat the crap out of your back. Mm -hmm. I would start lower rep and work higher and then play around with higher rep. Any thoughts? Yeah, same here. Like if you're going to do a pause, um, I prefer lower reps anyway. Because if you have to do high rep 
and a pause, the yeah. amount of weight you're going to be doing is just um, might not even be that much to like really get anything out of it. And also with front squats, I actually find um, the three to six rep range to be really useful for me personally. I know it can be hard to quantify, but who makes better gains? Someone sleeping? Well, the if you look, if you look, if I'm training someone, they want to know like how to get in the gains pipeline. You need to get your butt to bed. You need to sleep like a fool. You need to eat like mm -hmm. a fool. Um, I've had some of my strongest moments when I wasn't sleeping much, but you, you know, you're in that pipe, man. You need to sleep and eat like a fool. Hundred percent. Um, I think one thing that kind of gets messed up is that working out and that whole like productivity craze kind of gets mixed together where people right. want to like, you know, work themselves like the entire day and then they wake up at 5, 6 a.m. to work out and then they kind of forget that rest is a very important part of training. And yeah, just sleep is the most underrated performance enhancing drug there is like... <laughs> When I was at my peak, I was very OCD about rest recovery. I would take a bath every day for at least a half an hour, just soak. I'd come home from the gym. I'd just chill on the couch. I was getting plenty of steps. I mean, I walked to the gym. I walked back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't like I was slacker. I'd play basketball a lot. But rest was legit, man. I would, mm -hmm. I would crush the rest. Theo, learn another language. Okay. Um, I took three idea. years of, of uh, Spanish, and I went to college in New Mexico, and I spoke Spanglish. I took uh, Chinese in uh, college. I took German in high school, and I know some Lebanese. That's all I got. I'm done. I'm too old to learn anything else. Uh, <laughs> how about you? What what secret languages do you speak? Uh, Vulcan? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, for quite a while, like. I was learning Korean a little bit and then like just to impress a girl who didn't even like me. Um, but that was like, like middle school time. Um, more recently, like there's a lot of Japanese fighters who comes to the gym I work at and like they run their training camps there. So every now and then I like, you know, pick up a bit more Japanese to kind of communicate with them because most of them don't speak that well of an English. My, uh, my grandma spoke German at home. You know, that's, um, <laughs> just some basic German, uh, you know, Spanish. I, I understand Spanish better than I speak it because I'm mm -hmm. so used to being around it. Um, I still remember my uh, Chinese lessons. You know, I like Chinese, uh, as far as I understand it, there's four different ways. You can say gao, gao, yeah. gao, or mm -hmm. gao. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it can be like four different words with the inflection. Yeah, like um, uh, Mandarin is a tonal language, and Mandarin is like simplified Chinese. So there's four in Mandarin. Cantonese, I think, has like seven or nine. So that one changes it like even worse. <laughs> Dude, I was and when I was in college, uh, we had uh, uh, this Chinese course. I'm like, man, this is gonna be fun, you know, do something different. The instructor was like a um, a 22 year old, you know, she was studying astrophysics, and really she spoke Chinese. 100 times better than she spoke English. I had no mm -hmm. idea what was going on. That was oh, the only thing. Astrophysics and Chinese, like that's two different languages being taught to you. Once. Yeah, that was way too much. I needed some medicinal marijuana, but I was in the middle <laughs> of New Mexico. So, just humored. I don't smoke pot. Uh, Nicholas, I wish I could visit gyms all over the world. Yeah, some of the most fun I have are visiting the really odd bodybuilder powerlifter gyms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just found out Stan Efferding like um, bought into one here in Vegas, and I started training there uh, this year. I would like to do my own gym locally, and if I did, we would do some member voting to kick out people that wouldn't re rock their weights. You know, we oh, would have pretty tight yeah. rules. Kick or don't rocks. shower. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you smell like ass, you're out of here. <laughs> uh, Horseman three two two boxing kettlebell pistol squat because it looks cool. Turtle. To answer your question, I've always wanted to be able to do a handstand. That's cool. Um, I used to do pike presses back in the day as a kind of ghetto uh, shoulder exercise, but I realized I wasn't really good at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. Like when I just didn't have any access to anything, I just I got good at all those really weird exercises. My main leg exercise was actually a, a box jump, I guess you could say, but I was really just jumping on anything that was like tall. So I asked, we asked a question earlier, you know, the things in your periphery, you wish you had time to do. And that's what people are asking. 
you know, we lift, we do whatever. Uh, Horseman said he wished he had time in boxing and kettlebell pistol squat. Lance said he wishes he had time to do MMA, jiu-jitsu. Uh, depending on where you are in career, not sure what's going on there. Tank Abbott was fun to watch. I just watched one of his fights uh, last night on YouTube when I was eating dinner. Mm. Yeah, so Tank was a, Tank was a beast. Uh, Stein would love to do more wilderness survival stuff. Same here, man. I used to legit before I met my wife, all I did to stay out of trouble was extended hikes every weekend. I would mm -hmm. just literally go into the woods and just go nowhere. Yeah. That's one thing I really miss about living in the Pacific Northwest. I was in, up there for about four years. Um, every single weekend was a different hike, like a different, there's always another lake, river, waterfall, shit ton of trees just to see yeah and depending on where you're at you know you you need some basic survivals because i remember being uh when i first moved to south carolina i'm like oh, i'm gonna do this little hike outside of the city and i'm like a mile out in the middle of nowhere you can't tell where the trail is going because no one hikes on it and mm -hmm. there and there's signs saying uh uh, gator crossing and you're going off this little path through a swamp with brush like 10 feet high and there's a sign before you 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 know that says gator crossing like <laughs> you never knew you never knew on some of these hikes when you're going to get yourself in trouble definitely uh d sir curl hi how's it going he meant board pressing i think uh brennan how much of a calorie deficit would you recommend uh if you're going to cut i want you to go as hard and as fast as you can uh, you know on the internet you know you'll get all this babbling random banter about to 1.5 per pound. <laughs> That's great. Uh, but in the world of coaching, how many people actually can or want to sustain a 16 to 20 week cut? That's true. Yeah. Get that off, man. I mean, go as strong as you can. When you can't go as strong anymore, just go to maintenance. All right, Nicholas. I seem to be the only guy in the gym who doesn't have earbuds. Uh, yep, you probably are. Um, while lifting, I don't think it helps my mind. That's fine, man. But, like, I just wear them because I don't want to hear that one guy on the cable crossover rapping to his. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, people doing badly, ra like, badly rapping or people yeah. unnecessarily grunting and moaning to certain exercises. Like, that bicep curl must be hitting him in a couple different ways. <laughs> before we, uh, before the pandemic hit, we got – a membership to LA fitness just so we could go in the mornings and work out. And there's mm. always this one dude who would, who would just be doing bullshit work and just rapping along to his music. Like, dude, just shut the fuck up. We're, it's five 30 in the morning. Could you just relax a little bit? Uh, anyway, you bet. Glad to help. Uh, any tips in programming overhead press and a push pull leg split so it doesn't interfere? One thing I do with a push pull legs is I have an A week and a B week, or an A mm -hmm. cycle and a B cycle. So the first push you lead off with a chest, the second you lead off with uh, an overhead press. Mm. I can never make the A like A weeks and B weeks really work for me, just because there are times where like mentally I'm just like, damn, I really wish I was doing my A workout on a B week, and then other times I'm on a B week, and I was like, I really wish I could be like doing it, like vice versa, you know? Just I just like uh, never really made that work for me, but I also know it's like it's a really good way of going about things, though. I don't like push pull leg splits, man. Same. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of hate towards body part splits, but that's what they are, really. They're just uh -huh. a body part split with upper work on the same day, which makes what kind of sense? Exactly. exactly. I don't know. Well, I mean, you do it. You're you're working in frequency, but then you're in the gym five or six days a week with two Only leg days the muscles a week. Twice, though. Yeah. Yeah, two leg days and two back days a week. Y'all are in some kind of S and M type of torture. <laughs> Very true. Uh, Georgie, have a more bench focused push day. Yep, that's that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations for warm-up routines on squats? Um, I don't know, man. Like, people ask me, do you do warm-ups? You know, just getting in the gym, finding plates, loading plates, moving around, getting your body temperature up. Mm -hmm. So I don't do anything beyond that because it takes long enough as it is. Do you? Um, I alternate. It just kind of depends on how I'm feeling. If my hips and knees are feeling a bit more beat up than usual, I'll start out my workouts with more isolations, like, like 
leg extensions, leg curls, hip abductors and hip adductors to the good girl, bad girl machine. But for the most part, if I'm feeling good, all I do is just the empty bar. I think one thing too is I actually take, I take, uh, I do two sets with the same weight. So two sets with an empty bar, two sets with 135 and then doing it that way. If I feel like I need more of a warm up, other than that, I just start with the bar, go from there. Additional stuff, and Matt went on to say, uh, uh, you know, stretching mobility. Additional stuff like that has to be needs based, like yeah. you have tight, mm-hmm. uh, tight hips. Um, you know, mobility. I, I hate mobility work. Yeah. I, I don't want to be mobile. You know, I, yeah. uh, I, I just, I don't care for it. So, if you like want, I'm, mo- oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, I was going to say, like, if I'm mobile enough to do what I'm training for which is squatting, deadlifting, pressing and whatnot. That's all the mobility I really need. Um, Of course, like I do like pull-ups and like whatever I need for boxing and wrestling. But beyond that, like anything else, just additional work, that's not really worth it. I am not dismissing, you know, things where you have more body control and where you are, have more flexibility and more well-rounded, you know, conditioning, but I'm not going to do that before squats. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, if I want to do yoga, I'm going to do it on a yoga day. If I'm going to do mobility, I'll do it on a mobility day. But when I'm in the gym, you know, it's it's uh, time to time to squat. Mike, I noticed I feel a lot more lat activation with the Meadows row versus dumbbell rows. Am I doing something wrong? No. No. Not necessarily. Uh, some people just connect with a minor change in angles or whatnot. So, um. How many years does it take to build an amazing physique as a natty? Stan. I think the bare minimum is like just to be very impressive, at least over most people's physiques is five years. Um, You'll, you'll look great at three, but like amazing at at five and then like totally impressive at around 10. Yeah. I'm trying to look up the next question, Uh, but you know, basically here's the thing. Where's my, you have about the average uh, natty has about this is your natural potential, whatever it happens to be. And whatever you ha- use up, you have about the ability to to hit half of that for the rest of for the upcoming year. So let's let's say you're perfect. OK, first year you get half. Second year, you get half of that half. Third year, you get half of that half. You're 90 percent of the way there after three years. How many people? Hit 90% after three years? Very little. No. I mean, even if you were going hard like me or Jeffrey Verity Skillfield or Stan or anybody, um, you know, uh, you just are not not going to get there. So uh, I got we got one more going on here. Uh, this is the last one. Chris Jones called out Greg, LOL. And I, I got the uh, – I got the the video right here. Um, So let me see if I can mute this. We'll just watch the first minute, shall we? And then we'll hop off. Let me mute the ad. Neural balance. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, here we go. Let me unmute the tab. When I was at Tiger, uh, Chris was part of the Tiger Fitness Posse. Can you oh. see it? I can see it, yes. What's good, YouTube? You know who it is. Chris Jones, representing Palm Chasers. Yeah, sun's out, guns out, baby. Speaking of the sun, we got like that two superhero minutes. cut That's off right now. About to get ready to go train some arms pretty soon, guys. So before I start this video, Shafts to Tennessee. No, nah, we ain't doing that. No. Nah. Pull up. No. Nope. Long story short, Jeff side. No. Nope. Maybe I will. I gotta reflect on that shit. But that's not what this video nope. address the elephant in the room. Yes, in the past. I'm. I can't do this. It's way too, yeah. way too long. Like that's my problem with a lot of like, the YouTube vlog fitness style of things like you watch a 15 minute vlog of someone just rambling for maybe one minute worth of actual useful content and even then that usefulness is very much debated <laughs> yeah no hate against chris jones but that's the yeah, video no. i'll put on when i poop 
you know, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be running on the background while I'm, you know, uh, chilling and talking to the dog and, you know, taking care of business, you know, like, Oh, there's the point. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, guys. In us, um, if you guys need any workouts, uh, you know, or any, uh, coaching, you can head over to superlivingtoday.com. Please show me your shirt. Raise that, raise that chest up there a little bit. Follow, please follow Stan strength on YouTube and on Instagram. Um, you know, he's a good guy. I, I wanted to, I wanted to have him on today just so you could kind of meet him. His channel is like 2,470 subscribers and uh, definitely somebody you want to follow. Has some good videos, podcasts with Basement Bodybuilding and uh, the Bald Omni Man. So please check him out. All right, guys. If you want him on again, drop a comment down below and let us know. And let's see if I can, if I can get the music. Uh, we are out of here. It's not almost over. It's not almost over. You're not almost there. You're not almost there. You're not almost there.